I'm Bianca Molay, and I'm originally from New York, from Long Island, transplanted to Northern California many decades ago, and I healed from Parkinson's myself. I was born in uh, Queens, New York, and um, I was a first child for my parents. They were both um, first generation America, uh, Americans. Uh, my four grandparents all came over from Italy. I was in Queens, just uh, a train or, or bus ride from Manhattan, and um, as a small child, um, my mother had been, uh, she had studied to be a teacher. She would take me to the museums and show me around. At a very young age, I went to Broadway plays. I was your consummate student. I love being in school. So if you love being in school, you want to stay in school. Well, how do you stay in school? You become a teacher. And when I was in high school, we got one day where we could go visit any classroom that we wanted and work with the teacher. And, and we didn't have to stay at the high school. We could go anywhere. And I selected an elementary school special education class. And then when I went to graduate school years later, I got my degree in education with a focus in special education. Bianca and I met in the mid 80s when we both were resource specialists at Drake High School in San Anselmo. She had a good relationship with the kids. She treated them well and she cared about them and uh, I, I respected what she did with them. And then I had some difficulty with brain fog, but I didn't, I was in denial about that. You know, being a teacher, my mind was my greatest tool and there couldn't be anything wrong with that. So I was having a lot of difficulty teaching five classes of the same topic and trying to remember each day where I left off with one class or another and I tried note keeping systems and things like that but nothing seemed to work well enough. Her condition both physically and mentally was, was pretty rough so um, I remember that uh, you know, um, she'd gained some weight and she was um, obviously um, physically frail. She had some tremors in her arm. She found she had some difficulty with her legs. And it was of concern because she wasn't quite sure what was happening. The trembling was the thing that I, that I did notice the most. Um, just, you know, with raising uh, a cup and I could see her hand. And uh, that, was, that, that was the thing that got me the, the most kind of scared, uh, was that you could tell that, that something wasn't right there. I started walking, uh, off, veering off to the side, like my balance was off. And um, this was particularly noticeable and annoying to people, like when I was at an airport and everybody's, you know, ro rolling their luggage along and walking in straight lines. And I would be sort of veering and, you know, a couple of times I had people make comments about that. And then um, riding my bike, I started falling and hurting my legs, so I stopped doing that. Maybe a period of, of six or 12 months where I, I noticed something was, was not right. Um, and, uh, you know, then I was projecting ahead long term, this was not looking good. So, um, both physically and mentally. Uh, it felt like, uh, you know, this could be uh, the beginning of, you know, a long decline. What finally led me to the doctor were two things. Number one, I enjoy food and I particularly like soups. And um, it was getting more and more challenging to try and eat soup. The other thing that really motivated me was that I had a young granddaughter and my grandson was due in a few months. and I wanted so much to be an active grandma. I wanted, you know, I wanted to be able to get down on the floor and play with them. I wanted to be able to share stories with them. I wanted to be able to go to the park with them. Um, and it, it was looking like that was going to be more and more difficult. So, and, and, and also my own autistic son, um, I'm in charge of his care. And, you know, I was thinking down the line, somebody's going to be in charge of my, my care. How is this going to work? In um, April of 2008, at age 59, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. So when I got my diagnosis, 
I was told that, you know, Parkinson's was incurable, irreversible, and progressive. But I know a lot of people that I understand get diagnosed and they get so depressed that they wind up in bed for several weeks. That was not my reaction, and that, I think, was because uh, through the experience of my autistic son's diagnosis, that's when I had that response. On the one hand, that was a very difficult thing, a very difficult challenge. On the other hand, it helped prepare me for Parkinson's. It was like, well, I got through autism. I'll manage my way through this. And um, I learned that um, education takes over where medicine leaves off. And I, I was following the Western medicine protocols. I was taking the, the Parkinson's drug, Cinemet 25 100, three times a day. Uh, and then after a few months, Requip XL was added. So I was doing that, and initially it felt okay. And it, you know, and, and for a while I thought, well, but these drugs make it so manageable. This is going to be all right. I can deal with this. But then gradually the, the drugs had less and less effect, and the condition was progressing. And I decided that it was uh, that I needed to use the tools that I used in researching for my son Justin with his autism because I had found some treatments that had helped him. And then I started doing my own research. After she was diagnosed with Parkinson's, she got involved with Qigong. And she got very involved with Qigong. I was signed up for the first time for um, Master Ming Tung Gu's class, The Healer Within. And I went to that class on June 19th of 2009, um, and it was totally life-changing. And I remember very well when Bianca came to my workshop uh, in California first time was the weekend workshop. And um, there are hundreds of people there, but she was very eager and um, came to the front to ask me the questions. And um, the question was very simple. Basically, you know, asking me what my suggestion is. And um, so in the workshop, I suggest to everyone that uh, more you practice, more benefit you're going to receive and cultivate. I remember Ming Tung explaining such ephemeral, arcane concepts in a way that it was understandable. And um, he talked about energy, and he talked about blockages, and it all made sense. So I was, I was very interested. And then when we got into doing the practice, um, he was teaching the lift chi up, pour chi down practice. And I was having some difficulty cognitively making my, well, cognitively and also physically, like making my body, understanding what needed to be done and then making my body do it. But I just, to quote Ming Tung, made my best effort. And I continued to make my best effort for three hours a day until I healed. Parkinson's disease in Western medicine is a neurological uh, dysfunction, disorder, and um, it's, it takes um, a, some, a period of time before we diagnose it. Meanwhile, um, the patient might experience a variety of symptoms, like the, the, the most common is tremors. In Western medicine, um, patients are given medications that help their dopamine, which usually bottoms out uh, medications like level dopa and uh, muscle relaxants and stool softeners because a lot of times they get heat and they get uh, uh, problems with elimination. Uh, Chinese medicine looks at the energy fields and where they go, the body's like a network and the energy flows in this network that controls our central nervous system. So in the case of a uh, boxing condition or in general, neurological condition, um, yes, we know 
the, the problem is relating to brain, nerve system, the communication between the brain with the rest of the body, including the arm, including the leg, including different part of your body. So that is um, when understanding is true, but deeply, yeah, what is connecting the entire body, communicating, yeah. Um, affecting the communication of the entire body is energy, is a connection between the mind and the body. So the mind is initiating the communication in the conscious level, subconscious level, as well in the subtle energetic level. Slow the energy, the communication can happen, connection can happen. All the function, regulation of the nerve system, including, you know, motor function, memory function, in the coordination, and all different activity of the body is coming out of this communication. So the key is connecting with energy. The energy, yeah, linking every part of your body, linking the mind body, linking different aspect as human being, you know, the physical dimension, the emotional dimension, the mental, spiritual dimension, and actually how we are connecting with the earth is so important for our health. And Qigong uh, is also moving your life force. And Qigong, whether we go to a class or whether we do it on our own, it facilitates our, our own healing process and patients need to do it. I attended the first, uh, the first Qigong experience, that workshop on June 19th, and I left for the retreat mid-September mid and um, was uh, was off all meds by then. I wanted to be off all meds by then because I wanted to go to the retreat with no symptoms being masked. I wanted to work on it in its full glory. That being said, there was already some healing occurring. I was already less fatigued. The tremor at times was calmer, but a lot of times when I practiced particularly, it was more intense. And I want people to know that that happens, that that's a part of healing, that it can be a good thing, you know, to have more tremor because it's actually tremor is movement and then energy vibration is movement. So it, in, it can intensify. I know that people hear about somebody with Parkinson's getting off medication, doing Qigong. I've heard people tell me, well, I'm going to throw out my pills and then do Qigong. It's, that's not how it works, you know. So I, I want people out there to be very aware that this is a serious commitment and um, when I was going through this, I didn't know about compounding pharmacists, and there weren't very many around. And um, my doctors, I knew I could not approach with the fact that I was practicing Qigong and needed to gradually reduce my medication. Um, but now there, you know, more and more people are finding alternative approaches, and it's not so unheard of. So um, I, I would like people not to do it the way I did it, which was with no assistance. Um, I think it's important to have professional assistance. Yeah, she, she told me about getting off of medication. She was, she was very excited about it, and I was excited for her. And, you know, you could see both the, the physical uh, and, and mental benefits uh, of uh, the practice over the, uh, the previous few months. Her energy levels were much higher. Her confidence was much higher. Uh, she seemed to be really enjoying life. And it, it was, again, it was... Uh, very heartening for me because that's what I imagined for her in, in her retirement uh, and it seemed like it was a bit supercharged so she went from a space where um, she was um, not healthy and, and not happy to uh, a place in life where she was excited um, and feeling good and, and found a community uh, that was uh, sharing in that discipline and, and um, uh, mutually fulfilling so it, it was uh, it was a great transformation over those couple of years. She started doing the Qigong, and I was hoping that the Qigong would help it. I never considered the idea that it could get rid of it, but I thought it would help it, and it seemed to help the symptoms and push the symptoms back. And then the more she did it, there, eventually there were no more symptoms. So it was a real commitment on her part. 
She was totally committed and dedicated to put in three hours a day towards Qigong. And her message was, anything I can do to ward this off is, is worth it. And as far as I know, she's still putting in three hours a day to Qigong. <laughs> but it's a, it's a lifetime commitment to her, and it's worked. The main thing is it's worked. When I first heard Ming Tung suggest you know, that if you had a serious or chronic condition, you should practice uh, uh, three hours a day, I got very annoyed. <laughs> I, I, I said I could feel the steam coming out of my ears, you know, <laughs> what? And, but that only lasted a few minutes because then I thought, what's the big deal? You're, you're on, I'm on the sofa 12 hours a day. So if I spend three hours doing Qigong, then maybe, you know, the other nine I could be productive. So, um, and, and besides which, when it, it, it wasn't that I was, you know, doing intense physical activity. The, the, the movements are so slow and meditational, and I believe that that's what really helped get the mind and body back together was the slow movement. And when I work with people, we work not only on moving slowly, but speaking slowly, giving other people a, the, the pragmatics of language. Um, which sometimes when you have a chronic condition, you're in such a hurry to get out everything that you need to get out. So working on the pause, working on being, uh, being slow with the movements. It wasn't that it was physically exhausting to, to do it. And, and um, the sound healing meditation, I lay on the, till this day, I lay on the couch and I put a, a lavender scented beanbag pillow over my eyes and, and, uh, and it's lovely. It transported me to a place of sanctuary. I did not generally practice three hours at once. It was generally in 40 minute to an hour block, sometimes less. I try to encourage people to do at least 20 minutes at a time, preferably more, because I think you get deeper into the field when you practice, into the chi field when you practice a longer period of time. So on one hand, in the case of uh, Bianca was uh, the key that she was able to not only practicing three hours a day for quite a long period of time, but also she really has a consistency, create a structure, a consistent structure, knowing when to do it, yeah, and what to do it, what's the, the recording, the guidance she needed, and what is the support system yeah, available for her at a time. So she made this whole teaching and practice and support system most workable for her, yeah. And so as each practitioner students need to figure this out and to apply into your own practice, your own life in general. Regarding retreats, not only have I noticed a difference when I'm attending a retreat, but also I spoke to the people that I work with before this filming and I asked if there's anything that they wanted to contribute about their experience with Qigong that if I could, I would convey to the general public. And one of them, um, who was a Buddhist practitioner for years before she ever came to the practice, uh, said that she finds that the retreat, retreats were extremely helpful, the, the power of the qi field, of the community, um, the incentive, the motivation. Somewhere around a year and a half um, after I started practicing, I went to the uh, neurologist and was diagnosed as symptom-free. So I was told, you're symptom-free, and if you don't have any further complications, don't come back for another year or two. But we do want to see you again. So I waited the two years because I was feeling so good, I didn't want to go to the neurologist. And I went back and, and was declared Parkinson's free. I see Bianca now that she's healed from Parkinson's disease as a whole person. It's really simple. She's active, uh, interested in things, reads, um, likes going to movies, <laughs> uh, busy. Uh, something of a of a more relaxed um, uh, frame of mind, discipline. Being a um, uh, a Long Island New Yorker with uh, you know 
uh, a characteristically high energy and anxiety level to a little bit more relaxed. And I could see that in all her interactions, including with the, uh, with the family. Um, and I think the most important thing is that uh, just seeing grandma healthy for, the, um, for, for my kids, um, that was super important. Uh, and the energy level too. The, you know, with, to have a grandparent with a, with a high energy level, high energy of engagement, that enriches the life of your kids. And, um, and that was something that, uh, that she brought that's, uh, that's really important. The contrast between who I was uh, up to and including Parkinson's <clears throat> and who I am now I think it's funny, the one word that comes to mind right away is that I would have never described myself as unflappable, and I'm probably still not unflappable, but I'm, but I'm, much, I'm, I'm much more in that territory now than I ever was. I shrug a lot off, I view the day differently. I'm 71 years old, I'm obviously further along in my life than I've ever been but I feel like I have fields and fields of flowers in front of me to romp through. I, I, I'm just, um, I, I don't look at time the way I used to, and I realize that the practice helped teach me that because when you have a condition like Parkinson's, it's progressive. So you, you're playing beat the clock. But again, when you step into that practice and you're just moving so slowly, your body, mind, and spirit together, there is no real time that you're dealing with, and it's it's so wonderful. And I realize that when I step into Qigong, I'm stepping into timelessness. So that takes a lot of the pressure and stress, the pressure and stress off of everything. After I healed, um, I definitely felt I had a job to do. That a new job had just been created for me. That I had to get the message out and. Robert Rogers contacted me and asked me if I would be interviewed for his radio, internet radio show. And I said I would. And at that point in time, um, he, after the interview, he said to me, you better get uh, a, a blog and a website because you're going to be bombarded with emails, which is what happened. As a result of meeting with Dr. Rogers and starting the website and the blog, then um, I put together uh, two books, Reboot and Rejoice, which the title kind of tells the story. You know, I mean, reboot your thought processes, reboot your practices, and, and, and then rejoice in the outcome. My second book, Make Time to Heal, focuses on um, <clears throat> the wisdom healing Qigong practices and uh, visualizations and um, tips uh, how to integrate Qigong into your life 24-7. My practice now, I get over an hour every morning, and then later on in the day, I will do some more meditation, and I will work in some more of the awakening practices, um, and sometimes lift Qi up, pour Qi down as well. Uh, plus, I, I uh, co-teach a, a Monday night class for an hour and a half, so I get practice and then, and I volunteer with a special ed class one day a week, so I get practice there. I do Qigong with them. I love working with the special education kids with Qigong. They're a middle school class, and, um, it, and it's a class of varied abilities. I would love to bring Qigong into the schools, maybe introduce first through special education, and then it would be great to get into a PE class or a mindfulness class or something like that because I think that um, our future might even depend on it in terms of critical thinking and creativity and everything that is so necessary right now. Um, I'd love for our children to be given this gift. Parkinson's has been a gift in my life and I realized that very early on, actually even before Qigong, I was that positively oriented and when I had to break the news to my friends, that was really difficult, um, you know, dealing with their response. And I remember after I healed, having some friends come up to me and say, you know, when you told us that you thought Parkinson's was a gift, we nodded and smiled because we're your friends, but we thought you were crazy. And look what happened. It has been a gift and, and it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving because of uh, the physical healing was just the start. Um, 
and then the mental emotional healing and, and the work that I'm doing now um, and the outreach and just being able to, to help people and to, to give them hope. So uh, it is the gift that keeps on giving and I'm grateful to Ming Tong and Lin Ling and Dr. Peng and all the wonderful masters and practitioners, every one of us out there who does a practice, um, we're, adding, we're adding to the quality. Uh, of, of other lives and uh, the planet.